Dragons are arguably the most well-known mythical creature in the West. If you've seen my video, The History of Disney and Dinosaurs, you can think of this video almost as a companion piece because it's going to relate quite a bit back to the other one, so I do suggest watching that first if you haven't. I'll provide a link in the description if you're interested. The idea for this video isn't mine, but instead came from another YouTube user who suggested that I do the history of Disney and Dragons and coincide the release with the Chinese New Year for 2021. It's not something I thought there would be enough content for at first, but as I've done a bit of research, I think there are some interesting things to talk about. I've come to the conclusion that Disney and its history with dragons is actually one of disappointment and quite a bit of lost entertainment potential. As for the person who suggested the idea for dragons, unfortunately it seems that they deleted their comment for whatever reason, and I can't credit you because I don't have your username. That being said though, thank you for the suggestion, and I hope everyone enjoys the video. This wouldn't have happened without you. So when doing research for the history of Disney and dragons, I thought I would take a look at Disney Plus and see what dragon related content there was. In my video on dinosaurs, I connected scientific understanding of dinosaurs to their portrayal in popular films, and subsequently how Disney portrayed them in both their own films and in the parks. Here though, it's a little bit different. I first discovered The Reluctant Dragon, a film released in 1941. The premise of this film is that Robert Benchley, who was a contemporary comedian of his time, is coerced by his wife into pitching a storybook to Walt Disney, also called The Reluctant Dragon. Benchley, in his extremely dated comedic style, plays a perverted man-child who chases after women on studio property and stumbles into situations where he harasses the animators and artists in his attempt to procrastinate a meeting with Walt Disney. He also enjoys interrupting classes to make racist caricature jokes, although if we look at this segment here, we can also see that Disney animators seem to have been on the same page. Can you tell that I don't like this film? Eventually, Benchley meets up with Walt Disney to pitch his wife's idea as a premiere for a new cartoon short is being shown. Surprisingly, it's the exact same book he's holding, and the short depicts a conflict between a pacifist, poetry-loving dragon and a knight by the name of Sir Giles the Dragon Slayer. The two come to an agreement to put on a spectacle to satisfy the bloodthirsty townspeople and it ends with the dragon joining their society after its false defeat. I didn't know what to expect when going into this film, but it appears to just be a poorly aged attempt to showcase the Walt Disney Studios campus in Burbank, California, which was new at the time. The next piece of dragon media that I explored was a cartoon called Dragon Around, which premiered in 1954. The premise is that Chip and Dale are reading a story about a knight slaying a dragon, and through their imagination, mistake Donald's steam shovel as one. They proceed to fight Donald in his construction vehicle, and while it's a cute short, that's about it. We also have the 1977 musical entitled Pete's Dragon, about a little boy who escaped from slavery on a farm with the help of his cartoon dragon Elliot, and they find themselves in a series of extremely contrived shenanigans. Again, can you tell that I don't like this film? It was remade again with CGI in 2016, but I have no interest in watching it. There is also a segment in the often forgotten 1963 film, The Sword in the Stone, where the witch, Madame Mim, turns into a dragon to fight Arthur. I wouldn't say that any of these Disney dragons are iconic, but the exception would be Maleficent in her dragon form in the 1959 film, Sleeping Beauty. Out of all of the mentioned material, the only film I actually enjoy is Sleeping Beauty, but even then, if we're looking for dragon content, there's not much. In my video on dinosaurs, I mentioned how I felt that the dinosaur film was boring. A lot of people in the comments disagreed, and so if you enjoyed the films that I went over here, I don't intend to disregard your opinion. I just personally find that most of these films range from boring to kind of okay, and in the case of The Reluctant Dragon, really quite distasteful. For being such an interesting mythical creature, Disney's portrayals of dragons have, for the most part, been underwhelming. When we think of dragons, we want something fierce, terrible, and compelling. In the film and animation divisions, it appears that Disney is quite lacking. That being said, at least we can read into the cultural context of these depictions. Have you noticed any similarities between these dragons? Let's explore that. The idea of dragons seems to find itself rooted in most cultures of the world, strangely enough. 
Generally though, early conceptions of dragons aren't what we recognize today. For the most part, many ancient cultures had large serpentine monsters, such as the Leviathan from the Old Testament, or the Hydra from the labors of Heracles. I suppose that the Hydra from Disney's romanized adaptation of the story could be considered a Disney dragon if you use this criteria, but these early monsters aren't the dragons that we know today. But where do the ideas of these large monsters come from? Well, I think it's quite obvious. Just as the myth of the Kraken likely came from sailors seeing large squid, these early monsters were likely explanations of the accidental discovery of dinosaur bones, or at least that's one plausible explanation of many. The idea of the western dragon, however, seems to be derived from medieval Norse mythology. The first dragon that I recognize as something beyond a serpentine monster is the dragon from Beowulf, an epic likely written sometime between the 10th and 11th centuries. While the literature is written in Old English, it does describe a Scandinavian adventure. The dragon in this story is angered when a cup is stolen from its lair and proceeds to attack numerous towns in retribution. When Beowulf and his men go to confront the dragon, Beowulf enters the dragon's lair by himself and is mortally wounded, but with the help of his men as they rush in, ultimately defeats the dragon. This depiction is important because it's not only the first western conception of a fire-breathing dragon, but Beowulf becomes the first western dragon slayer, and the behavior of treasure guarding becomes a common attribute for these creatures. In many Norse sagas, the idea of stealing treasure from a sleeping dragon is a common plot point. One of the most popular stories of dragons comes from the Welsh monk, Joffrey of Monmouth in the 12th century. In this story, a young Merlin witnesses a tower that keeps sinking into the ground where a pool underneath is discovered. When drained, two dragons, one red and one white, emerge and begin fighting, often attributed as symbolism of the conflict between England and Wales. The popularity of dragons in medieval mythology persisted, often even finding them depicted in heraldry. Skipping ahead, dragons continue to play a large role in Western literature today. Tolkien's The Hobbit features a jealous, treasure-guarding dragon named Smog, and the popular Harry Potter franchise depicts dragons throughout numerous films and books. Dragons are everywhere in Western fantasy, and these Western depictions made their way right into Disney's films, even if they aren't the compelling beasts that we often want them to be. I am anticipating that a lot of people are thinking it, so let's finally talk about Mushu from Mulan. Yes, he is a Chinese dragon, and as far as I'm aware, Disney's only depiction of one in film. Chinese dragons resemble Western dragons in their serpentine-inspired form, but take on a different cultural role. First, Chinese dragons are not treasure-hoarding fire breathers intent on destruction. They can possess a number of supernatural powers, such as shape-shifting or controlling the weather. They also exist as spiritual creatures and are not typically aggressive. Second, Chinese dragons are often used symbolically. This can range from representing the imperial power of political dynasties to being associated with strength or luck. Dragons are often depicted artistically during the Spring Festival or Chinese New Year. The nation that we think of as China today has quite a long history of mythological and cultural depictions of these creatures. Trying to distinguish between different historical depictions and beliefs can get a bit messy though. Tianlong, derived from classical literature as one example, are flying celestial dragons that guard heavenly palaces and full chariots. However, during the Ming Dynasty, there are accounts of the nine offspring of the dragon, which is a completely different type of interpretation than the many dragon types found in earlier texts. In East Asia, especially in Korea and Japan, depictions of dragons can also be found that strongly resemble the Chinese dragon, though they often play somewhat different roles and seem to be more associated with water and weather than the Chinese versions. What's interesting about Mushu is that as a character, he's meant to assist and guide Mulan in maintaining her family's honor. Obviously, it's not a true Chinese interpretation of a dragon, but it's kind of in the general spirit. Even if he's not a great guide or mentor, he's also not a ruthless beast. So now we get to the part I'm interested in most, which is dragons in the Disney parks. And what I believe is not only the first, but also one of the most unusual depictions, we have Figment at the Imagination Pavilion in Epcot. In the original version of this ride, Journey into Imagination that opened with the park in 1982, Figment was a purple dragon and imaginary companion to a character called Dreamfinder. Today, people perceive Figment as an annoying character in an aging and somewhat underwhelming ride experience, but the original attraction is often considered to be one of the best ever created. It was an Omnimover that took you on a journey when you encountered Dreamfinder as he collected dreams and took inspiration from them. In this scene, he uses his imagination to think of Figment, who then becomes your guide throughout the rest of the ride. 
You go through a number of rooms representing certain ideas in this order. Art. Literature. The performing arts. And science. At the end, you reunite with Dreamfinder, but along the way, Figment was your curious but endearing guide. This attraction was a top-tier classic that was unironically creative and had extensively detailed show scenes with the intention of inspiring its audience, as so many early Epcot attractions also did. Wanting to find a reason to renew with the sponsor of Kodak, Disney killed the attraction and it was replaced with Journey into your imagination, which was met with outright disdain. Not only was Figment a beloved character that couldn't be found, but the new attraction was far inferior in its storytelling and guest engagement. It felt cheap. With so many complaints, the ride was refurbished once again into the current iteration, Journey into Imagination with Figment. It uses the same ride track as the previous iteration, but now the premise is that you're taking a tour of the Imagination Institute, guided by a Dr. Nigel Channing. As the tour starts, Figment returns, doing everything he can to be as annoying as possible. The attraction takes you through a series of labs meant to trigger the imagination through the senses, but every test is essentially sabotaged by Figment's antics. I don't hate this version of the ride, but it's a far fall from grace. It is otherwise just an okay experience, but ultimately a disappointing one, considering how great the original Figment was as a character. If you're interested in learning more about the other versions of this attraction, definitely go check out Martin Vids because he's done extensive documentation and restored a lot of footage for these iterations in his videos. I'll provide links down in the description below. The next dragons we're going to take a look at are a bit more traditional. First, at Disneyland Paris, the castle has a walkthrough attraction underneath where you can see an impressive animatronic dragon. While the animatronic itself and the atmosphere are fantastic, our continued theme of lost potential with dragons comes into play. This little walkthrough feels like it should include something more or should even be an actual ride. I know that there were some plans for a dragon roller coaster, which we will talk about a little later, that would have been perfect for this park. Again, this attraction isn't bad, but a lot more could have been done with it. It also reminds me quite a bit of Maleficent's dragon form, which you can actually see at the Magic Kingdom interpreted as a float for the Festival Fantasy Parade. Maleficent turning into a dragon seems quite in line with the medieval myths and their association with magic, so I think it's fine to classify this as a more traditional interpretation. Speaking of traditional, for the Epcot Festival of the Holidays, a number of performances are put on to represent holiday traditions in their respective countries. In the China Pavilion, Chinese New Year is represented by a performance of the Lion Dance, which depicts, well, a Chinese lion. It's a neat performance, and if it had been a dragon dance, it would have been perfect for this video. What's there is cool, but would a dragon dance not also be fitting, as it is also something celebrated during the Chinese New Year? The most interesting of Disney dragons never came to fruition, though. Many people watching are probably familiar with Beastly Kingdom, originally a planned expansion for Animal Kingdom that focused on the mythical realm. If you look around the park today, you can see remnants of the dragons that were supposed to be introduced, but unfortunately never were. The common narrative for why Beastly Kingdom never came to be was because the park went far over budget during construction. Not anticipating the proper cost to keep the live animals healthy, it was decided that a land from the original plans would be cut. The choice would be between Beastly Kingdom or Dinoland USA, and whichever was not built would be part of a new construction phase for the park after opening. As I mentioned in the history of Disney and dinosaurs, I feel that Dinoland was very much a direct response to the success of Jurassic Park The Ride at Universal Studios Hollywood and the new Jurassic Park land coming to Islands of Adventure. Since Beastly Kingdom was never built, a temporary land called Camp Mini Mickey was built instead, consisting mostly of meet and greets and an outdoor theater that hosted Festival of the Lion King, which has since moved to an outdoor theater in the Africa section of the park. That plot of land is where Pandora, the world of Avatar, stands today instead. But in the concept art for Beastly Kingdom, you can see it split into two distinct sections. In the Land of Light, there will be two attractions, with one being a maze where you discover a unicorn, and the other being a boat ride called Fantasia Gardens, themed around different segments of Fantasia. Most relevant to us, though, is the dark side of the land. Anchored by a ruined, foreboding tower, this attraction would be an inverted coaster where you steal the treasure of a jealous dragon. 
The idea was that bats enlist your help, and carry riders around in cauldrons where they could test the patience of the Guardian Dragon. Simply called Dragon's Tower, it's an attraction I would still really like to see come to Animal Kingdom today. That being said though, it did inspire something quite similar. Frustrated at the cost cutting and lack of creative outlet, many Imagineers left Disney to go work on Universal's new park, Island of Adventure. Even just walking through the shopping area called Port of Entry, you can see the influence of Animal Kingdom. More important though, was a land called the Lost Continent. There's a lot to say there, and that's another video for another time, but in the Merlin Woods section of the land, you had another iconic attraction, Dueling Dragons. Clearly inspired by both Dragon Tower, as well as the Dragon Story by Joffrey of Monmouth, as mentioned earlier, Dueling Dragons was an inverted B&M coaster with dueling tracks, framed as a battle and juxtaposition between two dragons harnessing the elements of ice and fire. It's sad that Beastly Kingdom and its dragon coaster never saw the light of day as originally intended, and Dueling Dragons, while an excellent attraction, continued to decline as the introduction of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter rethemed the attraction to be less interesting, and also eventually lost its synchronized dueling. The legacy of Disney and Dragons is one of lost potential. When I set out to make this video, I wanted to research the social context of dragons and see how Disney interpreted them in both their films and attractions. Instead, I found disappointing and problematic films, with reminders of extinct attractions and concepts that we likely won't see resurface. It would be absolutely incredible to see Dragon Tower finally come to Animal Kingdom, and even better if the rest of Beastly Kingdom came along with it, but I doubt it's going to happen. It is fun to imagine though, and I would like to hear your thoughts on what you think of this abandoned idea. As always, if you want to support this channel and its videos, please give it a thumbs up, and hit the subscribe button and bell notification to be notified when new videos are released.